Well, good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be with you again. I feel like this is my home away from home in Florida when it comes to Sabbath morning. And uh, we got to spend, for those of you who are not familiar, we got to spend uh, some time here in April over Easter weekend. Thank you, Pastor Shafter, for sharing your pulpit with uh, us today. I have my family with me, and, and I have uh, Carlo. You met uh, our son Carlo, my wife. You haven't particularly met my mother-in-law, who's sitting back there as well. She's kind of hiding down below there a little bit, but she's there. And our daughter, Kristen, and her husband, Kevin, are with us as well. So we're taking up a few uh, as well today. And it's Thanksgiving. Well, it's a Thanksgiving weekend, right? Yes. And we really should talk about Thanksgiving a little bit. Even if you talked about it last week, we can afford to talk about it one more time, I hope. Bible says that we should be giving thanks always, but I'm coming to that, and I will in just a moment. I want to uh, I want to share some thoughts with you from the Word of God today on Thanksgiving and what God has in store for us. And it looks like my phone does not want to cooperate with me right now, so give me just a moment. There we go. Now it is. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for what you've done for us. That is the center and the purpose and the focus of our thanksgiving. And today, especially in this worship hour, we want to turn our attention to what you have done for us. And that our hearts might be filled with thanksgiving. Even in the difficult times of life, realizing that these experiences also have opportunity to strengthen us and we will have reason truly to give you thanks. Guide our thoughts now. May your words be my words and my words be yours. And may our ears hear from you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. that came to them one day. 
they got a call to come in. It was the year 2016. It was the year that um, President Erdogan had uh, survived a coup attempt. And there was a lot of things that were going on. Now, we heard here about all those things that were going on, military leaders who were being purged from their jobs, and I suspect that many of them even lost their lives, and there was much more that was going on in Turkey. But hidden behind the scenes, what we didn't hear a lot of were the kinds of things that were happening in other settings. It was Andrew and Noreen who got the phone call one day, and they were asked to come in for an interview and they were suspecting or expecting that this was a chance for their residence permits to be renewed but instead they were told that they were being arrested so that they could be deported for 13 days he and his wife were kept there under arrest there were other missionaries at the same time who also were arrested and they were also deported. But they came to Andrew at one point, and they told him that his wife was going to be released, but he was not going to be released. And for the next two years, he remained in prison under false accusations of being a terrorist and other things, which is fairly common in those parts of the world. And he did not know what the future would hold for him during all that time. He was held in prison and finally he went through four different trials and in the last of his trials, his fourth trial, he had an attorney there and the attorney was trying to encourage him and help him and, and so on as much as an attorney can and the story is much more in depth than that. But looking at an article in, Christ, uh, in Christianity today, of September of this year, there was an article that was prepared by uh, Jacqueline Parrish, who had also spent years as a missionary. And she was writing up the story and interviewing him for that story. And the difficulties that they had there and, and so on, and they, uh, she asked him a little bit about his experience and she uh, uh, found out from him, and this is what he said at one point, he realized that this was obviously a political event. They were holding him for political reasons, using it as, him as an opportunity as literally a hostage for fun, some purpose that they could accomplish. And he said there were two reasons here for what was going on and the difficulty that it, he was experiencing. And he said one was human and one was spiritual. I think there was a larger drama going on behind the political dealings, which was God's story. What he was accomplishing through my imprisonment. And then Jacqueline asked him this question. She said, you explained that your two greatest fears in prison were losing your faith and losing your mind. How would you encourage other believers who are struggling to keep their faith and sanity in the midst of suffering and trauma? You see, part of the time he was kept in solitary confinement. And that kind of experience is just absolutely awful. And in listening to his story, it wasn't so much that he was in solitary confinement, but it was some of the experiences that he was going through. You know, you try to anticipate what that kind of event would be like if you should ever go through something like that. And when it's nothing what you, like what you expect, it makes it very difficult. And so she was really asking him about that because in his testimonies he's talked about not only his fear of losing his faith, but also his fear of losing his mind. And in response to her uh, question, she, he said, whatever you're going through, if you're working for Christ and his kingdom, then it is very precious to him. Throughout the day, I would repeat to myself that there was purpose in my suffering, 
that God was involved in it and that he had eternal it had eternal value because it was suffering for his sake mm -hmm. it's especially important I'd say to guard against resentment I felt abandoned by God and in those circumstances it was easy to let my heart grow cold when it seemed like God wasn't answering my pleas for his presence I would imagine a box where I would lock away all my questions and doubts and refuse to entertain them anymore. As Noreen reminded me, and he did get to see her from time to time in those two years, whatever doubts she said you have, God remains the same. He is faithful. He is true. He is loving. He is good. Jacqueline goes on and she says, You also explain how your crisis of faith was incomprehensible to your Muslim cellmates, since they had entirely different expectations of Allah than you did of the Father. In light of that, how would you say our view of God informs you how we undergo suffering? And then he says, My crisis of faith wasn't a matter of being imprisoned. That's persecution. And the book of James promised it would happen. It was more the feeling of abandonment. I had expected strength to pour into me. I expected to feel an overwhelming sense of grace. When this didn't happen, I became suicidal. I'll come back to Andrew Brunson's story in a few moments. I want to tell you that one of the Bible verses that is the most difficult for me, and if you were a uh, counselor like my wife, you would be able to explain what my problems are. But I am a cleric melancholy, and if any of you happen to know what one of those is, and if you don't, look at me, I'm one of them. <laughs> if you happen to be one, then you can relate to me. But there's a Bible verse that has always bothered me, it still does, because it's a real challenge to me. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'd like you to turn there with me, if you would, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. There's a certain amount of irony about me going to that passage and then saying what I'm saying. Because in that passage, we, we are so familiar with chapter 4, which talks about the comfort that we have in knowing that Jesus is coming again. You know the passage? In verse... Uh, 4.13 it says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Paul is encouraging the people, and he's talking there. Now in chapter 5, he goes on in verses uh, 16 and going on to 18, he says, rejoice always. Now that's the part I have a hard time with. There are times when I want to rejoice, but there are times when I don't want to rejoice. Do you know what I mean? Anybody else have that problem? I mean, be honest. Anybody else? Okay, good. I've got some friends here. I'm glad. Pray without ceasing, which, by the way, is part of the clue. And then verse 18. In what? Amen. In most things. Amen. See, I told you. It's hard because it says everything. Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now that's a challenge. Some people might have a personality that seem to take those things in stride. I'm not blaming God for my personality. I have my own responsibility for who I am, right? <clears throat> because I can nurture my weaknesses or it can nurture what God wants to do for me and how he wants to help me through those things. I can make those choices by, as Paul says, prayer. By turning my life over to Jesus and surrendering it to him even when I don't like what's going on. Even when I don't want to give thanks. 
But the experiences that Paul is, uh, speaks of and that scriptures speak of should really turn our attention to what God is trying to communicate to us. As I was preparing for this sermon, I had to be reminded of something. And that is that the Word of God, I almost can't remember an experience in the Word of God that we turn to, tend to look at and say, wasn't that an amazing story in the Bible? Isn't that fantastic showing what God can do? And every time you go to those stories, what was it? It was a lot of trouble. It was a lot of pain. It was a lot of difficulty that people were going through that we remember the good things that happened at the end, right? Now, Job is one of those that's a little bit, you know, more challenging along the way because he's suffering all the way through. But then we remember at the end how everything turned around and went the other way. If you go and you think of Daniel, it's the same kind of thing. If you think of David, it's the same kind of thing. You go on and on. The difficulties that people went through led to the experience where when they were able to give God thanks, that we really begin to see what God was able to do. As I started looking at some of the stories here, I want to share two of them with you just as a reminder this morning from the Word of God and what God can do. In preparation for that, I want you to think of this thought from the wonderful little book called Child Guidance. Christian author speaking to parents said, Educate the soul to cheerfulness, to thankfulness, and to the expression of gratitude to God for the great love wherewith uh, He hath loved us. Christian cheerfulness is the very beauty of holiness. Thankfulness is a gift from God, but it is also something we have to learn. We have to understand that we can educate choleric, melancholy people like me to think differently by turning to God and allowing Him to communicate to us and help us to understand what it is that we can learn through even the very difficult or especially in the difficult experiences of life. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Now the difficulty with these stories that are in the Word of God is we know the end of the story. You know how you, you get a book that's got a story in it and and you, you know this you probably got some idea how the story's going to end, but you really don't know how it's going to end. And you're, you're reading along, and you're really tempted to go and read the end of the story, but you don't want to spoil it all. The trouble is, you've already heard the end of the story, so it's already been spoiled for you. But I want you to think of it in this light. I'm going to share another quotation with you, and I found this fascinating, and then I'll remind you of it. Here's the statement. To all who are reaching out to feel the guiding hand of God, the moment of greatest discouragement is the time when divine help is nearest. Amen. They will look back with thankfulness upon the darkest part of their way. From every temptation and every trial, He will bring them forth with firmer faith and a richer experience. That's from Desire of Ages, page 528. To me, when I saw that statement, and then I realized the context, the context is John chapter 11. The author of Desire of Ages is reminding us of that experience of the disciples and two young ladies by the name of Mary and Martha and their brother whose name was Lazarus. And when you go into John chapter 11, you get into the story. Yes, you know how it ends because it's such a famous story. But imagine being there during that time, living during that experience, being with the disciples in John chapter 11. And they get word that Lazarus is sick and the disciples, you know, oh, Lord, let's, you know, let's 
let's go and let's help Lazarus out. And Jesus seems to be dragging his feet. That's not seeing. He was dragging his feet. He had a different purpose in mind for what was happening back in Bethany. His purpose was to give honor and glory to God in a way that could not happen if he had rushed back there at that particular time. But the disciples did not understand that. Lazarus did not understand that. And Mary and Martha did not understand that. They simply had to trust in Jesus, but they were impatient. They were not sure what was going on. And the disciples even thought they had a handle on it when they got into a conversation with Jesus after about three or four days. And, and uh, you know, they really, no cell phones in those days, no texting messages from Mary and Martha. It was just continuing on with Jesus, walking with them. And um, Jesus said, well, we need to go and, and go to Bethany. And, and off they went. And they got to talking about Lazarus, and Jesus said, well, Lazarus is sleeping. Oh, well, everything's fine then. We don't have to worry about anything anymore. And, and Jesus says, no, no, Lazarus is dead. And he was very clear, and he was very plain. At this point, the disciples are thinking, you know, something's not quite right here. You know, when we're going through the trial, most things don't seem to be right. The word thankfulness is not on our hearts during those trials. Thankfulness is something that we learn over time by trusting in God. Amen. When Mary and Martha hear that Jesus is nearby, they encounter Jesus along the way as well. And Jesus has a discussion with them and he shares with them some of the issues. In verse 30 of John 11, it says, Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Verse 32, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? There's so much that's happening at this particular moment in the story. The pain and the experience and the suffering that Mary and Martha and the disciples who also knew and loved Lazarus. But none of them really truly knew and understood what was happening there more than Jesus. Nor did anyone love